Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Tonight, SpaceX launched NASA's Imaging X-ray Polarimeter Explorer, or XB satellite. And this is an extraordinarily interesting launch for all sorts of reasons. But for the SpaceX fan, it is the smallest spacecraft that uh, SpaceX has dedicated a single Falcon 9 to. But beyond having a lot of room in its payload fairing, the rocket had to do something really interesting. About 20 minutes after reaching orbit, the second stage turned to the left and going sideways, it lit its engine for a massive 60 second burn, performing what can only be described as the world's greatest power slide, twisting the orbit around and putting into a zero degree inclination orbit right above the equator. One of the fascinating things to see here is if you look at the speed, it's barely changing. That engine is going at full thrust, it's generating 6 Gs of acceleration, but because it's pointed sideways, it's not actually changing the speed, but it is changing the velocity vector, turning the orbit around so it can get into this low inclination orbit. Now there's a couple of advantages of having this low inclination orbit, but the main one is that this is uh, an X-ray observation telescope, right? It's looking for ionizing radiation coming from distant stars and galaxies and nebula. And it's actually able to count individual X-rays as they arrive and measure their energy and their polarization. But they want to remove as much background noise as possible. And one source of background noise is radiation in space. Now, near the Earth, the radiation environment is very much controlled by the Earth's magnetic field, which traps uh, charged particles into the Van Allen belt. These start about 1,200 kilometers above the surface and they go out for a fair distance. Most spacecraft avoid them by staying in low orbits, but if they have to go to higher orbits, they go through very quickly to minimize the effect. But the actual shape of the Earth's magnetic field is quite complex. And there's a region called the South Atlantic Anomaly where the Earth's magnetic field is very, very weak. And this allows the Van Allen belts to actually come down closer to the surface of the Earth. And this means spacecraft in low Earth orbit passing through this region experience elevated levels of radiation. It's important enough that it's actually on the big map at mission control because the International Space Station in its it orbit, which is inclined at 52 degrees, passes through this for part of the day. And so if you're, say, designing an X-ray telescope that is looking for ionizing radiation events, then you want to avoid this region as much as possible. And the only way to keep yourself out of that permanently is to pretty much have a zero degree inclination orbit exactly along the equator. And there's an interesting precedent here, or parallel that can be drawn with to an old telescope. The first X-ray telescope launched into orbit by NASA was called Uhuru. So XP is built in collaboration with Italy. Uh, the Italian scientists built the sensors for it. Uhuru was launched from an Italian launch site, an oil or drilling platform off the coast of Kenya, which allowed it to be placed into a low inclination orbit. And this spacecraft, Uhuru, used a ground station in Kenya, and the same ground station is also going to be used by XP. Incidentally, I found this photo of uh, engineers integrating the Uhuru satellite back in the 60s, and that's a stark comparison to the clean room conditions seen today. And those clean room conditions, by the way, are how we know that this official NASA publicity image is fake, because if there was that much light being scattered by that flashlight, you might as well be building it in somebody's garage. This clean room test uh, is actually interesting because it shows a significant part of the, the vehicle's design. So the spacecraft, when it's packaged up, is about five feet. It's just under two meters long. And when it gets to orbit, obviously solar panels fold out sideways. But then the biggest part of the deployment is this massive boom that extends out uh, to bring the spacecraft to about 17 feet, you know, five meters long. So on the end of that boom are three sets of X-ray focusing optics. These are things that uh, reflect X-rays down into a focal point which is on the sensors in the base of the satellite. The eye in XP is for imaging, and if you want to make an image, you generally need to focus the light into a focal plane so that the sensor can make sense of it. Now, if you're working with regular light, you can use mirrors because mirrors reflect most photons, but X-rays are higher energy photons. 
and they actually tend to go through things instead of reflecting off. That's why we use x-rays in medical environments, so you can x-ray through the body. But x-rays can actually reflect off of metal surfaces if they approach it at a low enough angle. So they're coming in gently and bouncing off. So this is called grazing incidence reflection. So in a regular telescope, you would have a mirror arrangement like this. But in an x-ray telescope, you have a mirror arrangement like this. These are obviously circular mirror segments. And the one on the left is a parabola. The one to the right is a hyperbola and it brings it down to a focal point. But because the reflection angle is so small, the focal length is really long and that's why you need that really long boom. And to maximize the collection area, you will actually use many, many shells of concentrically arranged mirrors to, to get as much light collection as possible. This has a collection area which is comparable to an entry level telescope. The good news is that even though the satellite is very small, they still have room for three of these. So they get about three times a regular you know, entry level telescope. But it's not the, these mirrors that are important. We've seen mirrors like these that have flown on previous X-ray telescopes. This is the first telescope in a long time that can do both imaging and polarimetry at the same time. That is, it can detect the polarization of the photon as it comes in. And it does this using a gas-based detector. This is it Italy's contribution. When those photons come in, they knock electrons off of atoms, and depending upon the orientation of the photon, the electrons shoot off and create these trails across the sensors. And by following these trails back, looking at the density of the you know, ionization events they produce, they can determine the time the photon arrived, the energy and therefore wavelength of the photo, and through the orientation of the electron cloud, they can get an idea as to what its original polarization must have been. This is vastly different from regular optical imaging where you have an array of image sensors and those get hit by the photons and they accumulate multiple events. And after the shutter closes, you just read out how much electrical charge is accumulated and therefore how many events. This is literally taking a population of every single x-ray that comes in and trying to infer all the details and build up an image from that. So the P in XP is polarization, and the first astronomical object to have its X-ray polarization measured was the Crab Nebula. This was done back in the 1970s using a satellite called OSO-8. But it could only measure the polarization of the complete object, it couldn't do imaging at the same time, and you might find that polarization in one location would cancel out in another. So this is going to be the first time where we can actually look at extended objects and measure this from one part to the other. There's lots of different things you can do with this. One really interesting test is you can confirm the rotation rates of black holes because a spinning black hole will twist space-time near to its event horizon. And that is where the highest energy X-rays are emitted. So you'll find that the highest energy X-rays will have their polarization being different from lower energy X-rays. The polarization, by the way, arises due to various physical mechanisms. The way the X-rays may be scattered off an object will produce a preferential orientation. Or if, they, if there's electrons trapped in a very strong magnetic field, as they travel along, they're curved by the magnetic field and they're curved into orbits in a plane. And because the acceleration tends to be in that plane, you will find the polarization of the photons emitted are in that very same plane. So data from XP can tell us about the most intense magnetic fields observed in the universe near the surface of neutron stars, magnetars. And you know, there's always the possibility it might find something new, it might even find something that changes our understanding of physics, because we're looking at some of the most you know, energetic places in the universe. But I want to come back to the launch. This was the satellite deployment viewed from the upper stage of the Falcon 9 minutes after it had performed that massive handbrake turn in the skies over Africa. And we even get to see a bit of the deployment. Now, this is an image of the spacecraft next to its fairing, but actually the NASA photographer was uh, pulling a trick here to make the satellite look a little bigger than it actually was. Yes, the satellite had way more space than it was originally planned for. This was originally going to be a small, cheap mission with a low payload mass. And so it was actually baselined for the Pegasus. That was the first commercial launch vehicle that was successful. It was an air launched rocket carried underneath a plane and it had a very small fairing for that reason. 
20 years ago, Pegasus was a big deal. It was able to bring down the cost of satellite launches using commercial launch technology, but it could only launch very small satellites. It does, does have the advantage that because it can pick its launch site, because the plane can fly anywhere in the world, it was able to launch from this zero inclination orbit and therefore hit this required orbit for the mission. But then SpaceX came along and they bid $50 million, which was less than what Northrop Grumman wanted for a Pegasus launch. So the spacecraft design was mostly locked in, but it did allow them to make a couple of small changes to the design now that they had so much more leg room to play with. The original design had these deployable sun shields that were folded up to fit inside the fairing, but with the new larger fairing, they are just there folded out permanently. So that saves one step in the deployment process. Now, obviously the boom and the solar panels, those are still held in place during the launch because it's a very rough and violent process. But this was one thing where they could be permanently attached and it saved a bit of uh, effort. And the person that told me this is a guy called Ben Garlick. Here he is in the clean room. I'm gonna say many years ago, he actually came on to make a video with me promoting the University of Pennsylvania's Lunar X Prize entry. And now he's part of the commissioning team for XP. And I'm so glad that this mission launched, unlike, uh, well, their X Prize entry, or for that matter, any of the Lunar X Prize entries. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.